Okay, uh, because this is a Japan-related event, we're going to start exactly on time, uh, just like the Shinkansen. So uh, I'm happy to hand you over to Takatori, Mana Takatori of the Japan Foundation, who's going to give the welcome uh, speech. So, good evening, everyone. It is our great pleasure to welcome you all to this very special symposium today. Today, the 20th September 2018 is exactly one year's time from the uh, kickoff of the Rugby World Cup uh, 2019 in Japan. It's a really uh, big uh, international sport event for Japan. And as for the such events, some of you may remember that uh, the Japan host the Olympic and Paralympic Games in 1964, and then uh, Winter Olympic and Paralympic Games in 1972, and again in 1998, and then football, uh, the FIFA World Cup in 2002. And these mega sport event for Japan will be followed by the uh, Rugby World Cup 2019 and Tokyo 2020. And as you can easily imagine, such mega sport event would often leave lasting legacies uh, for not only participating athletes, but also for the host nation, its citizens and the society. So for me, uh, um, I still remember uh, the very vivid, cheerful uh, atmosphere of Japanese society when Japan first hosted Olympic and Paralympic Games in 60, uh, 1964. And still I can remember, and I can think, I could, I can sing a theme song of 1972 uh, Winter Games which was a huge hit in the Japanese pop music scene at the time. And actually, it, was, it became a sort of fashionable social phenomenon. And the Japan Foundation, uh, organization of uh, cultural exchange, cultural, academic, and educational exchange between Japan and other countries, we are deeply engaged with uh, such international big big mega sport event. And for upcoming the Rugby World Cup and Tokyo 2020, for example, we have already started to work with English Rugby Football Union as well as British Olympic and Paralympic uh, associations uh, to carry out a series of workshop on Japanese culture and the survival of Japanese language for uh, their staff and players, athletes. Uh, with uh, such input from us, we hope that uh, their staff and players, athletes, can uh, have a comfortable stay in Japan uh, because they are going to there and staying there for a while. And, and by this, we hope that they can uh, achieve, perform at their absolute best in their games. Of course, being Japanese, I also do hope that Japanese uh, players and athletes can do a good job, a slightly better job against uh, British players and uh, the athletes in their games. Okay. And also, yes, uh, we have, all, have been also collaborating with primary schools across the UK, uh, introducing uh, some Japanese culture and Japanese language to younger generation, uh, making the uh, most uh, of this occasion, of such uh, international big occasions. And this today's symposium, uh, jointly organized with TOAS, is another good example. And I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to SOAS, with whom we are proud to have worked together for a long time. The actually, this symposium, today's symposium, can be seen as an extension of our, again, uh, successful collaboration last year. Uh, the, it's a symposium, uh, the sports and diplomacy last May. 
um, in partnership with Japan Sports Council. And again this year, uh, my thanks go to Japan Sports Council for their continuous cooperation. I would also like to say thank you to uh, our sponsors, Toshiba and Sake Samurai. Without their generous support, this event could not be, have been possible. So I'm very exciting, uh, our speakers and chairs, uh, who I'm sure will uh, use their extensive knowledge to explore various aspects of today's theme. And lastly, I do hope through this symposium, uh, we are able to learn more about the lesser known uh, sides of both uh, rugby in Japan and Japan in uh, Japanese uh, international big events, and which I also hope will lead us to consider uh, the more uh, the some important issues and challenges in relating to uh, rugby and Japan in the context of this current uh, social circumstances of this global society. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Takatoli san uh, Good evening, everybody. Um, for those who don't know, uh, who don't know me, I'm Helen McNaughton, and I'm chair of the Japan Research Centre here at SOAS. Um, and it's with much pleasure that I welcome you on behalf of the Japan Research Centre and the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy um, here. And this is the third in our series of uh, sports symposia that we are hosting in the build-out to Japan's hosting of, uh, of course, the Rugby World Cup 2019 and Tokyo 2020 Olympics. And as Mana said, it's been a great pleasure to work with uh, the Japan Foundation and alongside the Japan Sports Council in this series of um, uh, sports events. And I'd also like to give a huge thank you to the Toshiba International Foundation because they've very generously um, funded our entire sports symposium series today. And I think we have two reps from Toshiba here tonight, Okamura-san and Shan. Thank you. Uh, thanks to your foundation for their generous support. So our previous two events, uh, events have been on the history of the Tokyo 1964 Olympics and Paralympics and beyond, um, but tonight it's all about rugby. So I'm going to welcome and introduce our speakers. Um, first we will have Phil McGowan, who is curate, curator sorry, at the World Rugby Museum in Twickenham. Um, together with Mike Galbraith, who, uh, from De Montfort University, but who's also a former player and historian of the Yokohama Country and Athletic Club. So they're going to present together on the early origins and the pre-World War II history of Japanese rugby. Then I'm going to follow on from that, and I'm going to present on the development and growth of the game in the post-war decades in Japan. And this will be followed by Hilary Frank, who is currently a Cornwall councillor, um, which might not seem relevant at first, but... Is it? Sorry. Oh, Simon going next. Actually, I'm going to change the order, because I think Simon's better at the end, and he's not ready yet, are you, Simon? <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> I'm going to have Hillary go after me, um, um, and she's going to reflect on her experience with um, various organizing committees that deliver Japan's involvement and participation in mega events, mega sporting events. Feel free to sit right at the front. Um, and then our final speaker is, um, don't worry about the reserved signs, they're reserved for you. <laughs> Our final speaker is going to be uh, Simon Chadwick from Salford University of Manchester, who will consider rugby in Japan within a broader uh, global context of rugby. So each session is going to be 15 minutes, um, which should give us a good half an hour for a Q&A session led by my CISD colleague, Simon Rofe. Um, and I should apologize that we couldn't get our bigger lecture theater that we had our last two symposium in because it's currently under refurbishment. So I hope you don't feel like that you're in a scrum tonight, but um, I'm sorry, it's a little bit cramped. 
Um, and finally, uh, let's not forget that following this, um, I'd like to thank Sake Samurai, who are next door setting up for our drinks reception after this. So uh, we are continuing with our winning team of Sake and Sports, which has um, been the theme in our, in our sports symposium series as well. So uh, we're now running early, which is great. Uh, not even on time, we're running early. Uh, so let's move on and tackle tonight's theme. Uh, one year out today, as Mana said, from kickoff in Japan, Rugby World Cup 2019. So I'm going to hand over first to Phil and Mike to talk us through the pre-war history. Mike, turn that, no, don't play around with that. Good evening, everyone. Um, okay, so my name is Phil McGowan. I'm the curator at the World Rugby Museum, which is based in the south stand of Twickenham Stadium. Um, we had a large refurbishment earlier this year, reopened in February, uh, and that's the new museum that you can see there. Uh, that's the Sport of Empire in the World Room, where we talk about how the game uh, went to the different rugby playing nations around the world. This is our old museum, a similar type of room, but uh, uh, obviously uh, a little bit older. Uh, and on the wall there, we had one paragraph which talked about how rugby travelled to Japan uh, and told the story of, of that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, um, how the game first arrived in Japan, uh, the story that we had on the wall, uh, which uh, kind of started in 1899. Um, it was brought to Japan by two men, uh, a Japanese man, Dinosuke Tanaka, and Edward Bramwell Clark, an English expatriate who was born in Japan. Uh, and they took the game to Yokohama, uh, to, sorry, to... Um, Keio University in 1899. And they were part of a tradition, so there they are with their students. That's uh, Clark on the left and Tanaka on the right in the middle in the white, white clothes. And they were part of a tradition which goes back to these guys who I'm sure many of you recognize. Um, they are known as the Choshu Five. Um, it, from the late Edo period in 1863, these five young samurai stowed away um, got a boat to Hong Kong and then another boat to England uh, and enrolled here at the University of London uh, and their secret mission was to discover the secrets of the West, take them back to Japan and then help Japan develop uh, and they succeeded in their mission of the five, uh, one Ito Shinusuke, uh, later Hirobumi, became the first Japanese Prime Minister, um, Inoue Monta, later Kaoru, became the first Minister of Foreign Affairs and Nomura Yakichi is known today as the father of Japanese railways. It was a very successful mission, uh, and they were followed by the Satsuma Seven in 1865. And Choshu and Satsuma are the two rebellious domains who played a large role in the Meiji Restoration in 1868, which then accelerated the process. So more and more young Japanese noblemen uh, were going to England to study, uh, and that included Jinoski Tanaka, who in, who was born in Yokohama in 1873, and by 1892 he was attending lay school in Cambridge, uh, where he was introduced to rugby, and he was a good rugby player. He was described in a school report as a conscientious forward at his best in the scrum, um, and then he went to Cambridge University to study law and literature. He then was reunited with his friend, uh, Edward Bramwell Clark, who he had known uh, as a boy, sorry, he's on the right-hand side there, who was also born in Yokohama, he was a British expatriate, his fa father was a baker, uh, had a bakery in Yokohama, part of the first wave of immigrants uh, into Japan after the restoration. Um, so they knew each other as children and then they met again at the university. Um, Clark was a real sort of child of empire, he'd been born in Yokohama, he went to university in Kingston, Jamaica, and then he went to Cambridge to do law uh, and to play rugby with, uh, with Janoski. And then in 1899, they both uh, left university, went back to Japan uh, to work at Keio University um, and introduced rugby to the students. And this is the, the quote that um, Edward said. Uh, he introduced the game to the students because he thought it would be a useful use of their time. He watched them idling the time away and thought, why not put them to something more useful? Uh, so very similar to uh, Thomas Arnold at rugby school who allowed uh, football to be played at rugby school because he thought it was a useful, a useful way for the young people to expend their energy, a useful outlet for youthful vigour rather than rebelling and setting fire to books and burning down classrooms as they had done previously. Okay. 
So that was the, the story really of how rugby came to Japan for a long time as, as it was understood. Uh, introduced in 1899. It's a lovely story it's about the friendship of those two gentlemen. Um, and then the game took root from there. That jersey on the right-hand side there is from Keio University, it was used in 1904, and is therefore the oldest rugby jersey in Japan, or it was before I brought it here. And that will be on display in our exhibition. Um, and that's the story of rugby in Japan, except for this one inconsistency uh, in this image, which is, was, has been in our museum collection for a long time. And anybody who's familiar with Yokohama might recognize that that looks a lot like a rugby game on the bluff uh, in front of Mount Fuji. And it dates from 1874 and was first published in a magazine called Graphic Magazine. I'll say no more, no more about that because Mike's going to talk about that in more detail later. Okay. Um, after KO, 1899, it was introduced to Doshisha University in 1911, Waseda University in 1918. Uh, and those two, gave, those two universities contested the first uh, intercollegiate uh, match later on. Uh, Waseda played a, a big role in, in the early development of the game. Um, and the game developed, uh, gained a really quite important patron in 1920 uh, in the shape of Prince Chichibu on the left there. Uh, Prince Chichibu is, or was, sorry, let me just find my notes. The second son of Emperor Taisho, he studied in England as well for a year in 1925. He went to Magdalen College at Oxford. Uh, and at that time, he was introduced to the gentleman on the right, Shigeru Kayama, who was a rugby player, a very talented rugby player. Uh, and he'd gone over to England um, to play rugby, and he, he trained with Harlequins and Richmond uh, in the year that he was there. Uh, he met Prince Chichibu and explained the rules to the game to him, who subsequently went to Twickenham and watched the England match there and then went back to Japan and tried to help rugby develop. Um, so the question would then be, why would such a high profile individual as Prince Chichibu take an interest in a sport which was really developing at that time? And the answer to that may lie in, partly in the First World War. Um, the First World War obviously was a, uh, not a good event, but rugby came out of it quite well. Um, the response of rugby players at the start of the war was, um, was praised by the War Office when they produced this uh, recruitment poster in 1915, citing the example of rugby players uh, and their readiness to enlist as something that other sports should emulate. Um, and then Jellico, the who was the commander during the Battle of Jutland, made that comment about the, the attributes of, of rugby players and how they went to make good soldiers. Uh, and rugby almost became like a secret weapon of the British Army during the First World War. And lots of um, matches were arranged for the, for the soldiers whilst they were training. And there's a programme from one there, Barbarians versus South Africa. So that didn't go unnoticed overseas, uh, and particularly countries who were developing their martial, uh, their martial uh, disciplines in their country in the 1920s saw rugby as a way to uh, help them do that. And so rugby grew in Japan in the 1920s. It also grew in Germany in the interwar period quite fastly as well. Um, another reason might be um, that, that, that he had come to the same conclusions that Pierre de Coubertin had come to earlier. Um, he visited rugby school in 1883 and 1886, and then he wrote L'Education d'Angleterre in 1888, and he cited sport as, as one of the main reasons, the main drivers for the British Empire, the virtues that it and the, the discipline that it instilled in there, uh, and the students then transferred to, to the adult world. Um, he was a big supporter of rugby. He refereed several um, high-profile matches in France. Uh, and as you can see on the French jersey there, they have the two Olympic rings uh, incorporated in their early logos. So with the support of the Prince, the JRFU was founded in 1926. Um, and Japan uh, played their first match in 1930 against British Columbia, and their first test match against Canada in 1932. And this is the oldest Japan jersey that we've seen. It's from 1934. Uh, and an interesting feature of the jersey is the, the two open blossoms, the one that's closed. Uh, later on, that did open. And the, 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 pl the idea there was that uh, the third blossom would open when Japan played England for the first time, who were the, the, the originators of the sport. That proved quite difficult, but they opened it um, in 1952 when Japan played Oxford University the first representative English side that they've faced. 
Okay. Um, that's uh, an image of the, the first Japan team from 1930. Um, Later on in the 1930s, as, as the situation, the political situation in Japan changed, lots of Western pastimes were banned in Japan. They were condemned as being immoral and too Western, but rugby was spared from that um, because it was recognised as developing the, the type of attributes that, that Japan recognised and wanted. Um, it was briefly renamed Tokyo or fighting ball. Um, and interestingly, rugby survived World War II, unlike in Germany. Um, where as nationalism receded, then so too did rugby. In Japan, as, as Helen will probably talk about later, uh, the sport reinvented itself as the sport of, of diplomacy and business, and it, it continued to flourish. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Um, our exhibition, Brave Blossoms, the history of rugby in Japan, will open in November. If you are in Twickenham, please drop in and, and view it. Thank you very much. Everybody, uh, I'm Michael uh, Galbraith. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm um, Michael. Bunk. Okay. Can I sit? Yeah. That would be helpful. Okay. Is that okay? Good. So, uh, um, Michael Galbraith, Yoroshiko no Ashimas. So, Phil is told you the story of how rugby was introduced by these two gentlemen in uh, uh, 1899. Before they introduced to Keio, uh, Clark actually played for the Yokohama Country and Athletic Club and he also borrowed a ball to introduce it from the club, uh, I understand. So tonight in five minutes I'm going to take you through a little bit of the evidence I found that a form of rugby was being played uh, um, from 1863. Um, but the, the very first slide, I thought it would be best because uh, uh, all the newspapers are talking about football, 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 and many people say, well, this was uh, soccer or something like this. So I thought uh, I'd show you the first uh, reference to uh, rugby union uh, in, in, in the newspapers that I found. This is uh, 1879. And you can see it's a football match, Yokohama versus the fleet. The rules of the games for this occasion and for the sake of the naval team were those of uh, rugby union. Okay, so this is the first reference. And then it goes on to say, actually, that it uh, seemed to work better. The rules work better than the rules that the club are actually have been using up to date, uh, which suggests they weren't playing soccer, which some people claim. So that's the first evidence. Um, so now the 1863, so I'm putting the year at the top, 1863 is the first uh, evidence I've found of, of football being played. So just the one reference. And uh, this gentleman called Harry Lawson, well, he's, a, he's very young here, and uh, this is uh, what he, he quoted. Um, so he, he, he was the Governor General giving many speeches in Australia, and he recalled the first cricket match played in Japan in 1863, a remarkable feature of which was that half the players were playing football. Now, I, I don't understand how this happened, but this is the first evidence of football. <laughs> and below there, I've put, uh, I've kind of underlined key words. Uh, there's a later article which says he was a great fan of cricket and rugby football. Um, and he was an alumnus of uh, Marlborough College, which, of course, was a, a rugby-playing college. So next, uh, next evidence I have is uh, 1864. Um, this is actually in the British Medical Journal. And you can see uh, uh, it's about Yokohama in 1864. It's written in December. And it says, during the present cold weather... There is football every afternoon on the bluff, well attended by residents and officers. And uh, on the bluff, so 
This is very few, uh, about four years after Japan was first opened, and the uh, population of residents only 300. So how could they get 40 people, roughly 40 people together? The answer is all these British troops came from uh, England to protect the merchants after the Namamugi incident when Charles Lennox Richardson was killed. And a lot of the uh, officers were in the 20th Regiment, and it seems that uh, quite a lot from Cheltenham College went, went uh, there. I'm running out of time, so I'll... Yeah, you sure? Okay. So, um, uh, Charles Rochefort, you can see, see here, he, he's in the football team in, uh, in Cheltenham College at the bottom. Uh, where did they play? They played on the parade ground of the British camp. And so this is an 1870 photograph uh, showing an athletics meeting, but that's where they played. So next, 1866. So this is the thing that is uh, most interesting. Uh, the founding of a club, the Yokohama Football Club, January the 26th, 1866. And you can see on the... Uh, uh, they, they formed uh, rules, they formed a committee for the rules, and two of the people on the committee are from the 20th Regiment. And, uh, and Rochefort is one of them. Okay. Um, so this, uh, there was a news article, and then there was an editorial. And in the editorial it says that uh, some people from rugby, one or two from rugby and Winchester, uh, were involved in this. So that also suggests influence of rugby school. Uh, these are the committee members, so look nice. So I would like to now um, talk, to, talk about some of the best players. And there were two rugbyans. Uh, one was called George Hamilton. He, he, he was playing rugby in England uh, at Richmond. Uh, and he, uh, uh, he was crazy about sport. And the other one is Evan James Fraser. And uh, both uh, uh, Hamilton arrived 1870, uh, went till uh, about 1885, and he continually played uh, the sport of rugby. Bottom left-hand corner is after his death, the founder of the YCAC uh, describes him as the captain and great mainstay of the rugby team. Um, okay. Uh, this is the, uh, the photograph. Um, the interesting things on the photograph are the flag. Uh, for me, it says YFC, Yokohama, and there may be a furl there with, a, with the uh, B missing. So you can't see the B. So, why? so I think that's clear evidence of the football club still existing in 1873 when this game was played. And the other one is there is a guy wearing a cap in the center. Uh, this is very unusual, and I assume it's probably uh, one of the rugby guys, one of either Hamilton or Fraser. Where did they play that, that game? They played it here. This is an 1877 photograph. This was the ground for the YCAC until 1909, and KO played the first game there. Um, okay, I think we can scan. Yes, so this is an, one sentence here on the top, top, top left. Um, one of the, perhaps the best player was a Marlborough, uh, another uh, a Marlborough alumnus, uh, Edgar Abbott. And it says there, um, underlined, it says, uh, Mr. Abbott uh, uh, caught the ball and made a good run through his opponents and with a fine drop kick scored a goal. That seems to meet my definition of early form of rugby. Um, this simply shows that uh, Hamilton was still playing 1884. Um, that's almost the end. If I could just have another uh, couple of minutes, a couple of minutes, because I haven't mentioned Japanese people playing. Um, I have this book here. It's published in 1883, and by a teacher who taught in the Imperial College of Engineering. So I just just a couple of lines here. Oops, I've lost it. Okay, it says the frequency of sickness amongst the students and their generally delicate physique demanded greater attention to outdoor exercise. For this end, a football club was started. Um, where are we? Football club was started. Different members of the foreign staff took part in the games, uh, in which, for the time being, the, the, the students showed great uh, interest. Like this. So they were playing, but it didn't continue. What KO did, it continued. Uh, there is one more uh, I'd just like to read. Um, 
and it's from 1878, uh, early 1878. The Japan, according to the Japan Gazette, the game of football is at present in great vogue um, among the, around the students of the Yaigo Gakko, which is in, in Kobe or Osaka. They are at it uh, whenever time permits. Some darn right good kicks were given and received in truly uh, good nature. Uh, just one final word is um, uh, there was a doctor studying in St. Thomas's. St. Thomas's rugby team was one of the top teams. Uh, there were England players in this. His name was uh, Yoshihiro Takaki. And when they picked the first president of the uh, Japan Rugby Union, 1926 or 1927, they didn't pick a Keio guy, they picked him. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to take us into the post-war years now, and in 15 minutes I'm going to try and do the whole post-war um, decades of Japanese rugby, the growth of Japanese rugby. So I'm going to quickly go through the first two. I'm going to just going to point out some of the themes that are in the academic literature on rugby, look at the overview of the growth in the post-war decades, and then I want to concentrate on rugby in one industry in particular, the iron and steel industry, and you'll see why. Um, just to note that uh, this is my personal research journey. So a couple of years ago, I did a project on women's volleyball in Japan, and it was actually about um, a group called the Oriental Witches, um, and they played volleyball in textile companies in Japan, and basically the team was so strong that they essentially won gold at the Tokyo 1964 Olympics. So it was this fantastic uh, story with a lovely ending, of course, and that's them um, getting the gold medal. Um, so following on from that, I wanted to look at men playing rugby in in company teams as well, but obviously in a different industry. So men playing rugby in the iron and steel com companies. And I came across a nice little um, little um, name for them as well in the Japanese, the Iron Men of the North. And I'm going to talk about that team later on. Um, but it's how to wrap it up in a nice bow because it doesn't have the gold medal ending as yet. I mean, it wouldn't it be amazing if they won the Rugby World Cup in 2019? But as a Kiwi, I don't really want that to happen. Um, but they could... They're, they can play the All Blacks in the final if they like. That would be fine. Um, so one of the themes I'm going to draw out today, I'm, this is a, quite an early project for me, so I'm not quite sure where it's heading, but one of the themes I'm going to pull out today for you is the role of sport in reconstruction and revival, particularly in Tohoku, Japan, and it links nicely to the steel story, as I'll show you. Um, so there's the, the team I'm going to look at later, Nippon Steel Kamaishi. So rugby in the academic literature, I mean, we're talking about the non-medical literature. As you can imagine, there's a lot of injury in rugby and there's a huge medical literature. But when we look at the non-medical literature, some of the themes that we can pull out are gender in terms of identity, masculinity, femininity, and there's just one example. Uh, rugby is a mega event, of course. What are the implications of hosting these mega events for Japan and other countries? What do they want to get out of hosting these events? What's the impact for sports in other areas like economics and tourism? And rugby and migration. So rugby in Japan is a, is a, is a sports that's had a lot of migration of players into, uh, into teams, particularly from New Zealand and Asia Pacific um, countries. Um, but there is a gap in the literature that's looking at the corporate history of sport or the history of company sports in Japan is missing. So even when I looked at the Japanese language literature, um, I haven't seen much mention of this, which is why I want to pick up on that story myself. So to go through very quickly the post-war decades, um, there was a rebuilding of rugby, of course, after um, World War II. Uh, the All Japan Company Championship was established. Now, this is a translation into English that's commonly used, but when you look at the Japanese, they didn't have kaisha, they had shakai, society, people of societies, um, but it's translated commonly as All Japan Company Championship. Um, and then, as Phil said, international tours start with Oxford coming to Japan and Japanese teams going abroad in the 50s and 60s. Um, there was an NHK uh, Cup established in 1961, which was replaced a couple of years later with
with the All Japan Rugby Championship, and then uh, the university teams came up with a championship from 1964 onwards. Um, the first Asian Rugby and Championship was held in 1969, and Japan played in the first inaugural Rugby World Cup. There's a picture there playing the USA in 1987, and Japan has competed in every Rugby World Cup right up until next year, and of course next year is the first Asian nation to host the Rugby World Cup. Continuing through in the 90s, sevens uh, started to rise up um, in Japan, and, um, and then the top league, which is running now, replaced the company league. So that all Japan company league that was running from 1963 onwards was replaced in 2003 by the current top league, which, um, as we'll see, is still company dominated by company teams. And then um, Japan was selected back in 2009 to host next year's Rugby World Cup. And of course, since then, uh, uh, Japan has competed in Super Rugby with the Sunwolves. And of course, uh, rugby became an Olympic um, sport at, at Rio 2016. I don't really like showing Japan beating New Zealand at Rio 2016, but you know we always have to show when we lose as well. So, um, so sevens is a, is a growing phenomena and popular sport in Japan as well. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Japan's national team, so the Japan's men team known as the Brave Blossoms, and I didn't know that story about the third blossom, so that was really interesting for me to hear that. Um, they're currently ranked 11th in the world, and there are no Asian teams in the top 10. Um, and the Japan women's team are called the Sakura 15, Sakura being the Japanese word for blossom, um, and they're currently ranked um, 16th, and um, it's as we were talking about in our workshop before, it's gradually rising in popularity, women's rugby all over the world, including um, in Asia and, and in Japan. And of course, you all remember what happened in the Rugby World Cup 2015 when um, the Blossoms upset the Springbok in, in the, um, the match there. So um, that really put, I think, the Japanese team on the, on, the, on the map in terms of world rugby. But as I said, the other national teams that they have are Japan Sevens, Japan Women's Sevens, and of course, then you can go down into the junior leagues as well. Now, as, um, as Phil said, university rugby has long been played in Japan for a very long time, but, uh, and so that continued in the post-war. So the All Japan University Championship has been running since 1964, and those brackets and numbers are the number of times that those universities have won the champion. So you see Waseda has um, dominated, winning 15 times, but actually Teikyo has won about seven times in a row recently, so they're a really strong team coming up the ranks. But a lot of those um, universities are very old, and, uh, and as Phil said, the Waseda versus Keio versus Meiji are very long-standing rivalries, and those games get a lot of people, uh, you know, 40,000, 50,000 people coming to watch those games every, every year and played in national stadiums, etc. So university rugby continues as a big um, force for rugby in Japan. But what I want to concentrate on is this history of company rugby teams. So I've given you a very brief romp through the post-war growth of rugby, but now I want to focus in on company rugby teams, and in particular, the role that the iron and steel industry has played in, that, um, in, the, in the growth and development of rugby in Japan. So, um, as we said, pre-war rugby was dominated by educational institutions, and that certainly didn't go away. It certainly continued in the post-war. But this All Japan Company, or Shakai, Jin, Shakai Championship, began in 1948 and ran right up until 2003 when it was replaced by the top league. So in that sense, it's still running. Um, in the early post-war decades, as we'll see, it was very much dominated by heavy industry. Um, and this is both reflective of the fact that um, that was the nature of the Japanese economy. There was a big focus on heavy manufacturing, um, steel, cars, etc. Um, and of course, those industries were very masculine. Uh, they employed a lot of Japanese men. Um, and it's, it's, this is where it has parallels with the volleyball project that they did. So not many people know that the textile industry was a huge industry in Japan, particularly in the pre-war, but in the early post-war years. And that was a very female-dominated workforce. And so volleyball was chosen by textile companies as the, the appropriate sport for those women, whereas rugby was chosen as the appropriate sport for men working in, in the iron and steel industry. So I think there are some parallels and threads that I can draw there, although I'm not really going to do that um, today. 
Why did they choose rugby? Um, well, as Reg pointed out, they had, um, they had big factory grounds, so they had grounds to, to have pitches um, to play. They had, all the players were employees of the company, the same as in volleyball, so, and in those days it was lifetime employment, so you had these employers that could play for your teams um, so long as they were still standing. Um, and they, of course, as companies, they were able to recruit from the elite universities. So after you played for the university teams, you could go and join the co those companies and play for those company teams as well. And then when it turned um, into the top league, they, they, they further moved on by bringing in overseas players as well. What did it mean for the company? Well, in the early days, it was a good idea to keep, as you said, keep your your employees occupied in their spare time, supposed spare time, but it was also about well-being, exercise. If you have factory work, it's very repetitive. You're often just standing in the same position, so it was seen as a good way to help physicality. It was building team spirit, teamwork by team sports. Um, but later on, of course, it became a big business, company branding, company marketing, company, company imaging. Um, so that what it became now. So the 16 teams um, still in that league, as you'll see, I've just put in red the, the and with the exception of Coca-Cola, they're all um, Japanese teams. Um, and I think I've put them in the order of their dominance at the moment. So Suntory are dominant at the moment. But you can see the types of companies that are involved in that league. Now, the steel teams, um, for those of you who don't know, steel was a massive industry for Japan, um, designated as priority just after the war, and it very quickly boomed. So by 1969, Japan was the second uh, largest steel exporter until it was pipped by China, as in most uh, things recently. Um, and there was a huge merger of two steel companies to create Nippon Steel back in 1970. But before that, Yawata Steel and Fuji Steel were big steel companies, and Yawata Steel Rugby I'm going to talk about in a second. And then there was a later merger. So Japan still produces a lot of... Um, uh, steel. And this is a picture of the Yawata Steelworks first head office down in Kitokishu, built in 1899. And as you'll see in a moment, they, they had a very strong rugby team. It's now a world cultural heritage site. And this is a quote from one of the literature. So culturally, it was seen as a type of warrior or samurai endeavor. Um, so it gave the corporation a good image, but it was very much, as I said, dominated by heavy industries. It was seen as appropriate for a masculine industry to be playing a very masculine warrior type um, sport. So I just threw that in there to draw on that theme of gender and, and masculinity. So Yawata Steel was a very famous um, uh, rugby team. In fact, they won the All Japan Championship 12 times in that 20-year period, and this is actually the Japanese record for any company team that has won the championship um, so far. Um, then we have uh, probably more well-known, because they're still in the league, is Kobe Steel, who's won it 10 times, and the, and these comp uh, the company team I want to talk about in a minute, Nippon Steel Kamaishi. Um, so those were very dominant teams, but other, other, particularly in electronics, and Toshiba has a team, <laughs> team as well, um, are more dominant since the top league took over. So Kobe Steel, um, quite famous um, steel team. It's the only steel team, per se, still in the league. Um, founded back in 1928, they dominated, and um, you can see they won seven consecutive times in the in late 80s, early 90s. And um, this is Reg Clark, who's sitting right here. Stand up, Reg, give a wave. Um, he played for Kobe Steelers um, back just before they dominated, but um, nonetheless <laughs> played. Uh, but in fact, he was so good that recently he had to be replaced by Dan Carter in the team. So um, he's, uh, mind you, the way that Bowden Barrett was kicking last week, I think we might have to ask Kobe Steel to give uh, Dan back to the All Blacks, actually. But anyway. Um, but I want to talk about this one team, Kamaishi. So they were established first as Fuji Steel, but with the merger, um, they changed their name to Nippon Steel Kamaishi. And they were very dominant before Kobe Steel, and they won the championship consecutively seven times, um, 78 to 84, and they won it 10 times overall. And this is their seventh consecutive win, that photo there with being tossed in, tossed in the air. Um, since 2001, they're no longer, and with the decline of the steel industry up there, they've been reborn as uh, Kamaishi Sea Waves, not a top league anymore. Um, but um, they are used very much in the, in the idea of reconstruction and re recovery, which I'm going to move on to now. 
So Kamaishi was an area that was very badly hit in the Tohoku disaster. Um, so the sea waves suspended their rugby activities, helped as volunteers, um, and they resumed training a couple of months later only because the town really encouraged everybody to get back to normal. So they felt that rugby training would get everybody back to normal. But at the time, they set up the Scrum Kamaishi project which is still running, which helps to re uh, support reconstruction. Um, and they played their first post-tsunami game um, against Yamaha Jubilo back in 2011, which becomes symbolic in a second. So Kamaishi is the only purpose-built stadium for the upcoming Rugby World Cup. All the other stadiums are already existing, um, but Kamaishi is purpose-built in this town that was devastated by the tsunami, and you can see it on the right there. So they had their opening ceremony last month. With this, they invited back the same post-war team, who is top league and the Sea Waves are not, to play against them in the inaugural match to open the stadium. Um, it's actually built in quite a small village, eight kilometres north of Kamaishi, um, and it's built on the site of the previous schools that were completely wiped out by the tsunami. So it's quite a poignant, symbolic um, gesture by the Rugby World Cup to place it up there, but it's also being uh, a big recovery point for the town. So it's going to host two games. Um, we'll have a capacity of 6,000 going forward, but for the Rugby World Cup, they'll bring in an extra 10,000 um, seats. Um, and this is um, last year when I visited. These are the kinds of slogans that you see. So this, um, where I'm standing, the Japanese at the bottom says, let's stand up again with pride as a resident. So rugby is being used in this area, and in, particularly in this town of Kamaishi, to rebuild everybody. Um, and I think that's a really interesting. If you want to watch a video of that, it's a great video of that. So to conclude, I think that company teams were very integral to the growth of rugby in the post-war decades, alongside university teams, but they spread, uh, they spread the growth of rugby to, to more senior teams, post-university teams, um, and particularly the steel teams dominated, um, reflective of the economy at the time. Um, and it was also, I don't have time today, but it was also rugby was popularized in manga and TV drama, uh, various, um, those of you who are Japanese might remember the school wars drama. And then since the 2000s, I think we can see the, the, the further spread of popularity to sevens, to women's rugby, and to the golden oldies as well. So Japan is actually, apparently has the original club of its kind for over 40 players. That's a great video for you to watch as well. So given the aging population, I think we can see that that might be a, a, a big mass popular move for rugby as well. So it's a very quick romp through the post-war decades. I'll leave it there and um, pass over to Is Hilary. Happy to go next. Grand. Wow. I'm learning a lot here. So I'm not an academic. So what you're about to hear is not as academic as my learned colleagues here. It's a much more personal reflection on the years I've been lucky enough to spend with various sporting events in Japan. So Rugby World Cup, one year to go. Hashtag 1YTG. Um, Really exciting from the organizing committee's point of view, really exciting from Japan's point of view, and exciting from your guy, you guys' point of view, because the tickets are now open. The last round for general sales, for the ballots, for the tickets, open. You've got until the 12th of November, guys, to get your tickets to go over to Japan and watch some of the most amazing rugby matches you will get the chance to see. Um, ticket prices are actually quite low, so, you know, you don't need to save too much. Um, you will have spotted that I'm from Cornwall Council. Um, so I just want to have a quick chat about where Cornwall is because I'm passionate about Cornwall and where I come from. And just to kind of make you aware of, um, well, give you help you understand why I get from Cornwall to Japan. So this is Cornwall, guys, right in the bottom of England, the Southwest Peninsula. Very, very beautiful place. 
I'm actually from Cornwall Council, is what it says on your handouts. I'm not an officer of Cornwall Council, I'm an elected councillor on Cornwall Council. Cornwall Council is a unitary authority, so we have um, all the duties, the responsibilities, all the headaches of a county council and district councils all rolled into one big lump. We have 123 councillors, and this is what it looks like in our full council chamber. Um, and this is me. Ta -da! So the 123 councillors, actually the 122 councillors at their meeting in May last year elected uh, this lady in the middle, uh, Mary May, as their chair. And I'm currently the vice chair of Cornwall Council. So I sit at the top of these meetings and try and keep some order amongst all these politicians trying to talk away. It's not always easy. So how did I get from here to here? Um, this is me. This is the Web Ellis Cup. And um, in on the sorry, on your left is Monsieur Lapasse, who was the chair of the International Rugby Board, the World Rugby. Um, and this was our um, press conference when we released the venues that were chosen for the Rugby World Cup in 2019. Um, sitting right in front of me is Mr. Shimazu, who is current, or is not currently, he still is and still will be, um, the, the boss of the team that is organizing the Rugby World Cup in Japan. So, how did I get there? Very good question. It all started actually here. Thank you. So, as I studied Japanese in these very rooms um, a while ago, not actually not this room because it wasn't here when I was um, a while ago. I'm not going to tell you quite how long ago, but it started here. So, I studied Japanese, and that has been an amazing, um, amazing. Uh, offered me so many opportunities uh, throughout my life since then. Uh, opened loads and loads of doors and just given me the chance to experience lots of things that I wouldn't have been able to otherwise. So first of all, um, I was very lucky. I worked with the team that delivered the Winter Olympics in 1998 in Nagano. Then I went on to the 2002 FIFA World Cup. Dun, 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 dun. And now the Rugby World Cup, which is going to be next year. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about Nagano and the 2002 FIFA World Cup, just some personal recollections. So I'm not going to spill too many um, stories. So you just saw those symbols, actually, those three, Nagano, FIFA, and um, the 2019 symbols. There's another symbol here. Anybody recognize that one? Ooh, this is the golden thread that runs through all of these Olympics, uh, all of these major sporting events. that give anybody any clues? Oh dear. The Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications. It's um, Japanese government. And actually, why would that run through all of those events, do you think? Well, first of all, let's take you back to 98, Nagano. Now, there's one interesting thing about Nagano. Actually, whilst I've got the um, emblem up here, I love, this is my favorite emblem of any Olympic Games, actually, of any Olympic Winter Games. You can see the orange figure is supposed to be like a speed skater, and you've got a figure skater in there, a ski jumper, and they all come together to make a flower, which I think is actually a stunning emblem, actually. So Nagano, there's the prefecture of Nagano, but there's also the city of Nagano. Now, that doesn't really happen too often. I can't think of many places in Britain. We don't have a, a city called Cornwall or a city called Kent. The, the county, York and Yorkshire, I guess. Durham. It doesn't happen too often. I did say, I did qualify. So, uh, so very fortuitously, the prefecture and the city were the same name. So the organizing committee in Nagano was made up of staff, really from the Nagano prefectural office and from the city office. It was one of the only, only Olympics to date that has been organized by local government. It's quite, quite marked difference. Um, so you would have expected, actually, it's a sport event. So come on, guys, from the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology of Japan, you were going to step up, surely, and help run these Olympics. No. It was the Ministry of Internal Affairs because of that connection with the local government. So going back to Montreal in 76, it actually lost huge amounts of money. It was a huge deficit. So in 1984, nobody really wanted to organize those games. Nobody was willing to step up to the mark. Los Angeles was the only city that said, okay, guys, we'll take it on. They put in a bid. It was really focused on the commercial aspect. Um, 
corporate sponsors. It was a, a, an Olympics that was driven by the corporate community. It was criticized for it at the time. But look at that, $223 million dollars in profit. So because of that, it became the model for all future um, organizing committees for Olympics, but also for um, FIFA World Cups too. So all since then and before then have been very driven by um, corporate ideals. Nagano, local government, very, very, um, very rural. And this was the gentleman from the Ministry of Internal Affairs who was detailed to um, go, and, go and make a success of the Olympics. His name is Makoto Kobayashi. And before he came to the organizing committee, he was the top of the civil service in the ministry. So he was as high as you can get a career civil servant. So he was, his title in Japanese is Jimu Jikang. And in Japanese, uh, English, that's administrative vice minister. Administrative vice minister is quite a mouthful. So this gentleman is from the Inter Ministry of Internal Affairs. Not that many dealings with people from other countries. And suddenly, here he is in charge of trying to organize one of the most, the major winter sports events in the world, on the planet. So he goes, uh, uh I need some help. So I came in to help him. I went and moved into Japan. This isn't me. <laughs> this is. Anybody know who this is? No, I didn't, didn't really thought you... Didn't think you were because it's kind of got his um, glasses. And yes, it's somebody called Herman Meyer. I don't know, he was called the Herminator. An amazing, amazing skier. He used to ski as if he was fleeing from an avalanche. He was just right down the slope. Um, amazing. So he competed in the Nagano Games, first of all in the men's downhill. Now, the men's downhill, we had quite a big issue with in the organizing committee. I don't know if you remember, but. Um, there's a special environmental park um, on, in Hakuba, on Hapoone. The International Ski Federation said, wait a minute, this men's downhill is far too short. All the skiers are skiing in it in one minute, 30 seconds. We need to have this longer. We want you to put the start of the men's downhill into the environmental area. My boss, the DG, the, the director general, Mr. Kobayashi said, uh -uh, no, 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 we respect the environment. We're not going to start from there. You need to just have your course shorter, it's fine, you know, they can compete like that. The International Ski Federation was not, not pleased with this. Understandably, they want to be able to demonstrate to the world that the world's best athletes have the most challenging course possible. Um, with the Olympics, with uh, the FIFA World Cup, with the Rugby World Cup, it's the international sporting body that holds all the rights to the games, and they say to different countries, you have the honor um, of hosting it this time around. With the Olympics, um, it meant that we could go to the International Olympic Committee, to the president, to President Samaranch, and try and get him to arbitrate. So with the Olympics, you've got the, uh, I don't know, the um, International Ski Federation, the International Skate Federation, all the different ice hockey federations, and then the overarching body is the International Olympic Committee. So with the Olympics, we were able to go to President Samaranch and say, look, we've got a bit of an issue here with the Ski Federation. I clearly remember... Um, from Nagano, we snuck out. There was Mr. Kobayashi and me and his secretary. We snuck out at lunchtime from the Nagano offices, hopped on a train, hopped on a plane, went to Barcelona to meet President Samaranch and said, please, can you sort this out? We need some help here. That was Saturday evening. We flew back in on Sunday. And by Monday, we'd got a solution. Um, and the solution was actually we started it just around the corner from the, Olympic, uh, from the environmental area. And we had a little kind of... Uh, a jump that went over the corner. So in the end, they did start a little bit higher, but not encroaching onto the environmental area. This is what happened, though. When Herman Meyer went down that slope, he had the most amazing tumble. Uh, he should have been in hospital after that. He got himself up. Four days later, he won a gold medal, the Super G, and then later he won a gold medal in the Giant Slalom. An absolutely incredible athlete. Absolutely so moving on, um, this is uh, President Samaranch, who we went over to, to um, meet in Barcelona. And at the closing ceremony, I just wanted to draw on what he said. He said, congratulations, Nagano and Japan. You have presented to the world the best organization in the history of the Olympic Winter Games. So this is very key to all the sports events that have come since then as well. The organization that Japan is very good at organizing things, very organized. Oh, and this is just, I, I, I put this in there. 
So do you recognize anybody? <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. So this was actually the opening ceremony of the Olympics, and they got me to interpret for the emperor of Japan. Dun, 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 dun. But we'll skip on quickly for that. Moving on to the 2002 FIFA World Cup. So here we have um, the emblem on the right, and these were the venues in 2002. You can see they stretch from Sapporo all the way up in the north down to Oita in the south. Many of these are being used for the Rugby World Cup, um, especially Yokohama, which has hosted the final in 2002, will also host the final in the Rugby World Cup next year. So, here we go. World Cup. Sports. Ministry for Education, Sports and Culture. Are you going to step up to the mark this time? Nope. Again, it was the Ministry for Internal Affairs. Um, and this was... Um, Mr. Endo, who was in charge of the 2002 organizing committee. Um, he was also the administrative vice minister uh, before he joined the organizing committee. So when he joined, he said, oh, Mr. Kobayashi, you had Hillary helping you. I think she needs to come and help me now. So I went over to the 2002 FIFA World Cup. I loved working with the Olympics. FIFA was really tough, really hard work. They were, hopefully, they're not mafia now, but um, it felt like they were mafia at the time. Um, and also, there's only one governing body in that sport, so if we had an issue with anything to do with the World Cup, we, there was nowhere we could go to for arbitration. So FIFA was God, and it was tough, actually, really tough. I've put this emblem up. Notice anything odd about this emblem? I'm checking whether you're all awake or not. No? Oh, nothing. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, no, no. It's this. That's the actual one. FIFA World Cup Korea Japan. Oh. Ah. <laughs> I cut, cut and paste the Japan Korea one um, this morning, so I, I think I need to take that down before somebody shoots me. But um, when FIFA, in its infinite wisdom, decided it was going to be co-hosted between Japan and Korea, um, Japan, quite cleverly actually, jumped in and said, ah, okay, then we'll have the final, please. We'll agree to it if you give us the final. So FIFA said, okay, then. So Japan got the final in the 2002 World Cup, which is what most people remember about World Cups is where the final was played. So in return, um, FIFA said, well, even though J comes before K in the alphabet, we'll let you call it the 2002 FIFA World Cup Korea Japan. But in Japanese, most people would say Nikkan Kyosai, which actually puts Japan first. So there was quite a bit of diplomatic incident about which way around that should go. But, oh, I skipped on too fast. After the 2002 FIFA World Cup, I went to watch a sumo wrestling match. It was actually the retirement ceremony of a sumo wrestler. Six months later, I got married. Not to the sumo wrestler, but to the sumo as uh, so the gentleman who was watching sumo wrestling next to me. Um, and then I went back home, came back home here to Britain. And I have to say, I was so, um, so impressed and so moved by all the local governments, Nagano, also all the local venues um, hosting FIFA World Cup matches and the way they really were committed to their communities that I wanted to stand for council in Cornwall. First of all, I stood in Saltash Town Council and now I'm in Cornwall County Council. Town Council, I ended up being mayor of Saltash. So my husband, I wonder actually if he's the very first ever Japanese consort to a, to a mayor in Britain. I don't know. But there we go. So those are our two daughters. And now we live in Cornwall. So because I'm living in Cornwall, I'm very committed to what I'm doing in Cornwall Council. I do have a role with the Rugby World Cup, but I'm not living in Japan. Uh, when, Mr. when the boss comes over here, I will come along and tag along with him and interpret and do stuff like that. So Rugby World Cup, we've got that last, rugby. So one of the reasons I'm doing that, this is Alan Gilpin, some of you will know him. He's the tournament director. So that's the guy employed by World Rugby to deliver the Rugby World Cup in Japan. He, one of his comments, he's British, by the way, good, nice bloke. He said the interesting and slightly different thing compared to England 2015 is that the local governments in Japan own the venues. Here, Twickenham is owned by the RFU, but in Japan, the venues owned by local government. So that means, guess what? That the boss 
is from the Ministry of Home Affairs again, not from the Ministry of Education. This is Mr. Shimazu, who is organising, who's at the top of the team that's delivering. And before he came to the organising committee, he was the Administrative Vice Minister of the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Are you noticing a pattern here? So he said to Mr. Endo, who had said to Mr. Komayashi, ah, I need Hillary to help me. So that's why I'm helping him. This is uh, Mr. Komayashi in the middle. No, sorry, on the left. These are the mascots. I don't know if you've seen the mascots. These are the mascots of the Rugby World Cup. And uh, here we have some, yes. This is in Kyoto, just before the pool draw. So we have Bill Beaumont, who's the chair. We have Mr. Mitarai and uh, Toshiba as well. So, um, so just to prove I do get involved sometimes. So this was in Kyoto. We announced the um, match schedule. We had the pool draw. So these are the pools and the different uh, groups the teams will be playing in. Um, let's have a look. Kiwis, you've got a bit of a bit of a tough pool there, actually. England is in the pool with France, Argentina, USA, and Tonga. Namib Namibia has just recently qualified. Um, but Pool A, Japan has got Ireland, Scotland, Russia, and Samoa. Uh, the first match will be one year today. And then... The quarterfinals will be 19th of October, 19th and 20th of October, leading up to the final in Yokohama on the 2nd of November. So these are the venues going up in the north, Sapporo, which was used in the 2002 FIFA World Cup, then down to Oita. Um, incredible venues, some really spectacular venues. And as Helen touched on, I just wanted to, this is the only one, this is in Kanaishi, um, it's the only one that is a new build. All the other ones have already, or have already built. So I've picked up a picture of the tsunami. Kamaishi really was devastated in the 2011 earthquake. Um, and it's interesting that um, even though it's a very small city, World Rugby was very keen to try and build, try and have a venue in Kamaishi. They see um, Kamaishi as... Um, I, you're right, it's got that kind of iron history that links in with rugby. If you walk around Kamishi, you see banners saying, Kamishi, the home of iron and rugby. So the world rugby guys were, were keen to use rugby to, um, to, to build hope back into their city. Um, there are some beautiful stories, actually, of during just after the devastation, uh, rugby players coming over from New Zealand to help out. There's some real... Yes. And Dan Carter went as well um, uh, to help out. And it has a rugby heart. So the permanent capacity is 6,000. During the World Cup, we will put some extra stands at either end, and it will become 16,000. Um, this is what Bill Beaumont said at the very first match. Um, that was August 19th, it opened. The stadium stands as a testament to the indomitable spirit of the people of Kamaishi and will act as a beacon of hope and inspiration for generations to come, providing an important legacy for the future of this region of Japan that has rugby at its heart. It, World Rugby does recognize that this area has rugby at its heart. So a lot of people say, oh, yeah, first Rugby World Cup in Asia, first to be held outside a tier one nation, they're not going to be able to do this. Yeah. But the brave blossoms eating the spring box. <laughs> 38,000 applications. We've got 10,000 volunteer positions. 38,000 people have applied to actually um, become a volunteer. The World Rugby Values. Integrity, these were decided by World Rugby in 2009. Integrity, passion, solidarity, discipline, and respect. Now, those, to me, are exactly the same values that I see in Japanese society, particularly respect. So, Japan, respect, discipline, organization, it's going to be a great World Cup. It really is. So, get your tickets. So, Mr. Shimazu, just to finish with him, these are words that he wanted to send to you tonight. He said, in Japan, the sport of rugby has a history stretching back more than 130 years. Rugby's rich history here has cultivated a distinctive rugby spirit, the spirit of no sides, and the volunteers in the team uh, in the Rugby World Cup are called the no side team, meaning respect and fair play. We will ensure that the Rugby World Cup 29 will be a vehicle to further develop rugby, rugby in Asia and promote this rugby spirit. So I'm looking forward to welcoming you to the land of the Rising Scrum.
And he's given me some um, pin badges of the Rugby World Cup to do to distribute to you later. Okay. Hello, everyone. So, shh, shh. I'm not a historian. I'm not a, an international studies person. I'm not even Japanese. I'm not even a rugby person. So my, uh, I have been to Japan several times. Uh, and the first time I went to Japan, was to, uh, was to actually work with a J-League down in Kansai Prefecture. So I was very, very fortunate to get to work with, uh, with Gambor Osaka, Serozo, Serozo Osaka, Vissel Kobe. So for those of you in the room who are thinking, I've had a bit too much rugby, I'm a football guy, okay? So why, why have these people invited, why have these people invited a football guy, and that's soccer, by the way, not American football. Why have they invited this football guy to talk? Well, they, they've invited me to, to, to talk, uh, I guess for two reasons. First reason is, is back in 2011, um, when I was working at a previous university, we were approached by MasterCard, who at the time were becoming uh, a, a Rugby World Cup sponsor. And they, they asked us to look at um, rugby at, across different markets in the world from an economic and commercial perspective. So I work in a business school. Okay, I'm not a historian. I'm not a politician. I work in a business school. So I talk about commercial strategy and marketing, and from time to time, I talk about money as well, but, but I, I'll try not to tonight. Um, so that's the first reason, is uh, I've done a little bit of research. But the other reason is I just like Asia. So for those of you who want to tweet tonight, you're welcome to tweet. If you want to know a little bit more about who I am and what I do, that's, that's my Twitter uh, name. You'll see, I say, I say on Twitter, sport between Salford and Shanghai. But for tonight, I'll change it to sport between Salford and Sapporo. And I do, I genuinely believe that Jap Japan is cool. I do have to expand my portfolio of research activity to incorporate Japan. I am going to say things tonight. I'm going to share um, information which is publicly available. So all I've done is cut and paste, okay? But I've done it selectively. But if you want to know more about where I got this information from or you want to know more about what I've said, or you just want to send me threatening emails, that's fine. That's my email address, okay? So that, that's at the bottom. Now, I couldn't help but notice that as uh, some of the speakers were speaking, one or two people were falling asleep, and, and by the time I finished, everybody will be asleep. So I did think that a great idea would be to put the conclusions first. So I, I've never done this before, but I thought, put the conclusions first because people are going to fall asleep by the time you finish. So if, if you fall asleep before the end, don't worry, because this, these are the highlights, okay? <laughs> so these are actually quite important, and I'm going to work backwards and give you the data, but I think these are quite important, and they reflect some of the conversations I've had, for example, with Reg during the day. So wherever I go, and I, in 2016, I was very fortunate to go to the, the Rio Olympic Games and to spend a day talking about rugby. I got beaten up at the end of that day because throughout the day I was saying, I'm a football guy, I'm not a rugby guy. But I did listen and there were some really interesting things being said that day when talking about rugby and what people repeatedly were saying that day and other days when I've talked about rugby is Japan is an important market for rugby. So you can assume that. So for the Japanese people in the room, you are being talked about as an important market for rugby. And I think that's based around population size, big. 
uh, the size of your economy, notwithstanding some of the economic difficulties you've had over, over recent decades, you are still a, a large and, and um, large economy, obviously with significant disposable income. And there is some evidence, and I'm going to talk about this evidence tonight, there is some evidence of a predisposition towards rugby. Um, beyond that, very simple conclusion, if you are a man aged over 60 on a high income, then you are a character, you are characteristic of your typical Japanese rugby fan. Now, there may be some young women in the room, young men in the room who say, no, well, okay, I accept that. But the, the typical profile of a Japanese rugby fan is man over 60 on a high income. Getting into this, what, as you'll see, women have got a kind of ambivalent relationship, indifferent relationship towards rugby. Um, and there are issues too around participation, although I'm not going to talk about participation tonight. But one of the things that we talked about earlier is, is some potential around women's rugby. But the reason that I was in Rio and why I'm mentioning it now is the importance of sevens. So you've got a great event coming up. I'm sure, sure the, uh, the, the, the World Cup next year will be an amazing occasion for Japan. But there's something really interesting right now about sevens. And I know there's a Chinese person in the room tonight. I know there is. And what's really interesting about China is China suddenly has woken up to rugby too. And the reason that China has woken up to rugby is because of sevens in the Olympic Games, because you can win a gold medal. And so I think one of the interesting things for Japan is, yes, talk about the, the, the 15 aside game, but you've also got to be thinking too about the sevens. We had a conversation in the workshop beforehand. Does hosting a mega event have a positive impact? Socially, culturally, health-wise, participation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Economically and commercially, eh, maybe. So all of the research that's been that has been undertaken scientifically, as opposed to people who are promoting a product, uh, the scientific researchers out there in the world tend to suggest that at the very best, the positive in, in economic impact of hosting a mega event is marginal. Maybe you'll make a little bit of money out of it. We could have a broader debate, and maybe you could ask questions later. You know, how, why do you say that, Simon? How, how have those conclusions been drawn? But if, if Japan is expecting a bonanza, a fan, economic and financial bonanza, it's probably not going to happen. Um, just as it didn't happen in London 2012, although the British will tell you it's just incredible. That was an amazing Olympic Games, you know, commercially, actually. Everything's marginal, even going back to 2002 World Cup and other Olympic Games and World Cups in the past. So they're the conclusions. So for those of you who are now going to fall asleep, it's been great speaking to you. Kick off your shoes, put your feet up, and I'll see you again sometime. For those of you who are going to stick with it, here we go. So the first one, I drew all of this. It's publicly available. You can Google it. It's from a, a report by SMG in conjunction with YouGov. It's about uh, the popularity of rugby around the world. Now, I don't, I, hey, brilliant. I was panicking last night. I was thinking they won't be able to see the graphs. They won't be able to see the graphs. You can see the graphs. Fantastic. Unless, it's, unless you're at the back and you're, you're, uh, you're short sighted, um, you should be able to see the graphs. As you can see there, uh, South Africa, New Zealand, the big ones. Uh, you'll find Japan nestling in the middle there. Uh, and what you'll see is that around 17% of the Japanese population says that they follow rugby, but only 4% of the population loves rugby. Argentina, Australia, Brazil, England, France, Ireland, Italy, Japan, 17% followers, 4% lovers. New Zealand, Russia, Scotland, South Africa, United States, Wales. Okay, so there is some interest in rugby. I, I wasn't lying. When I drew those conclusions at the start, I wasn't lying. There is some interest in rugby in Japan. So 17% follow rugby, 4% actually call themselves rugby lovers. So in terms of numbers, what does that mean? For Japan here, 9.2 million people call themselves rugby followers. 
7.8 million people call themselves rugby lovers. So that gives you some sense of who's out there in the streets of Tokyo and Osaka and elsewhere. Um, but it also gives you, gives you some sense of the potential market for ticket buyers, people who go and see the event this time next year. In terms of uh, male and female fans, Japan here, 29% of men. Uh, so 29% of people say that are rugby are men. Women. And in terms of splitting that down a little further, this is what we have. So 65% of the Japanese uh, population actually feel neutral about 65% neutral, 70% rugby followers, 4% rugby lovers, 14% have no interest in rugby whatsoever. And I guess in terms of the sustainability of the sport and what happens next, uh, it's the followers and the neutrals. How do you convert, for those of you working commercially in rugby or related to rugby, how do you convert those neutrals, how do you convert the followers into passionate fans? In terms of adult interest in, in millions, you can see there, again, 35 million neutrals, 9.2 million followers, 4.8 million lovers, and 7.7 .7 million um, no interest in rugby. How does that split down? So for those of you who can't read, Japanese rugby followers, males, females, 18 to 24, 9%, 25 to 34, 5%, 25 to 44, 14%, 45 to 54, 18%, 55 plus 32%. So you're getting the picture now. You're going to be a man, probably. And you're going to be certainly 45 and, uh, sorry, certainly 55 and over, but possibly 45 and over too. So I'm guessing that some of the people in this room possibly really fit the typical demographic of a Japanese rugby fan. In terms of uh, age group, 65% of rugby fans in Japan are age 55 and over. Now, that's not a criticism as such. And as I said, as a sport marketer, I'm thinking straight away, well, OK, if you get kids playing sport, and you know it, the first sport you played or the first team you watched, that's still your sport, most of you, and that's still your team. And anybody who wants to argue about that later, I'll see you outside. It's true for me. The first team I ever saw, the first sport I ever followed, that's still my, it's still football. It's still the same team. So there's some interesting challenges there, and this is why the Rugby, uh, Rugby World Cup is so significant, is how you engage, for example, young people so that you begin to tackle this demographic skew towards older members of society who are following rugby. Now, for anybody uh, um, age 55 and over, sincere apologies, I'm heading that direction myself. And also, well, hey, yeah, I mean, as you know, you've got demographic issues in Japan right now. So the people in some of these groups here, 18 to 24, 25 to 34, they're absolutely crucial. Crucial. And not just for rugby, because football is going to be chasing them, and athletics is going to be chasing them, and skiing is going to be chasing them, and the movies are going to be chasing them, restaurants are going to be chasing them. So in marketing and commercial terms, if I'm in charge of Japanese rugby, I'm thinking, hey, World Cup coming, what can we do? Get yeah, these two groups in particular. Income. See, I didn't lie. My conclusions were not a fabrication. I didn't lie. So you're, gonna have a, you're probably going to have a medium or high income too. So the biggest group of, of Japanese fans are those who identify themselves as having a high income. So for those of you who can't see, just uh, prefer not to say low, medium, high. So just to, just to say, the figures that I've just given you are, are available from the source that I mentioned. Google it, very easy to find, full report, really interesting if you're interested in rugby. 
which of course I'm incredible tonight. I'm incredibly interested in rugby, not football. Now the second part of my presentation, short and sharp, uh, what is going to be the tournament economic impact? And this is drawn from a report by the organising committee of the Rugby World Cup 2019. Again, publicly available. You Google it, it's very easy to find the full report, really interesting. Again, I would recommend that you look at it. And this is the framework that they've used to understand the economic impact. Now, can I just say at this point, whilst you peruse that, is that one of the great things that, that people measuring economic impact do is they measure the benefits. And this is one of the big problems with, with economic impact studies. They measure the benefits. So they will tell you, we're going to do great business. We're going to have lots of tourists. We're going to have uh, lots of new construction jobs. We're going to spend lots of money on, on hotels and on beds to put in those hotels. It's going to create jobs. It's going to be great. And that is true. All of that is true. But the crucial thing that research like this very often fails to account for are the economic costs of hosting an event. So, for example, you, you alluded to it earlier, environmental degradation. You've also got pollution. During sport mega events, although possibly not in Japan, crime tends to go up. There's more drug dealing, there's more drunkenness, there's more prostitution. And this has to be policed. So there are economic costs. So for those of you who are, are, who are, when you ever read an economic impact study, take it at face value. You've got to delve a little bit, bit below and think about, well, okay, they're the economic benefits. What are the economic costs? But certainly in, in terms of uh, impacts, you can see the kind of impacts that are there. And when I did a study of this nature for the Champions League, I, 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 I did several uh, uh, studies for MasterCard in UA for the Champions League final. One of the, the things that always uh, caught my attention is, is people, when they go to a sport mega event, they go, and you know how it is, you've been to places before, you, you stay in a hotel, and you go to cafes, and you go to restaurants, you go to a museum, you might buy things in a shop, you've got to buy souvenirs for your families, and some of you will sit there and think, this is actually really nice. I'm going to come back again. And so you'll go back, you'll go back to Tokyo, or you'll go back to London, and, and you'll visit again. And so the economic impact is, is difficult then to measure because there's this kind of ripple out effect. And it's difficult to understand when it starts and when it ends. So that's just one example. But economic impact, somebody supplying the concrete for the stadium, somebody supplying the steel, somebody supplying the, uh, the seats. In the run up to London 2012, I met someone who was supplying the quilts for the athletes' village. So the quilts that you use in beds, it was just an, it was a mega contract. They were they were supplying something like 200,000 quilts. This was like the, this, this was their whole year's business in two weeks. It was just phenomenal. So all of this is factored in. So in terms of the numbers, these are the numbers. So. It is estimated that the output, so the, the output of the Japanese economy in preparing for and delivering this event will be 2.97 billion pounds. In terms of GDP increase, 1.47 billion pounds. For those of you who can't read the figures at the bottom, 0.15 billion pounds in terms of increased tax revenue. So all of these foreigners who are going to head towards Japan next year when they go to shops and they're buying things, they're paying tax. They're paying uh, uh, value-added tax, as we would call it, sales tax. Increase, increase in, in employment, 25,000 jobs. What you've got to ask yourself, and, and for me as somebody interested in the, the economics, business, and commercial aspects of sport, is... What kind of jobs are they? Voluntary jobs, full-time jobs, part-time jobs for just two weeks or four weeks or six months or a year. So these are the kinds of issues that, you, that we've got. In terms of international visitors to the tournament, half a million we're looking at. Um, I also do quite a lot of work in Qatar with the organizers of the World Cup in Qatar. And what's really, really interesting is, is up until two years ago, the Qataris had no tourism strategy. So they had no idea what they were going to do to get people to go to Qatar for any reason, let alone the World Cup. So what the Qataris have done is they've used the World Cup to drive 
the creation and implementation of a tourism strategy so that when people go to, to Qatar to watch the World Cup in 2022, you know, there's actually going to be things other than play, uh, watching football for people to do. Just as a quick aside, Japan is the biggest trading partner with Qatar, so that whenever you go to Doha, you see an awful lot of Japanese people walking around Doha, including people from Toshiba for that, uh, supplying things to various people. But that, that 400,000 vid- visitors, the reason I talked about Qatar and tourism, tourism strategy is, is if I was the tournament director or if I was the Ministry of Information, I'd be thinking, OK, we need brand ambassadors, we need advocates, we need people to go away and tell everyone, you know what, Japan, Japan's a really great place and that was a fantastic tournament, incredibly well organised. So what I'm thinking in my business school mode is, you know, how can we manage these things? How can we maximise the returns that we get from the money that we're spending on this kind of event? For those of you who missed the first time round because you were asleep, they're the conclusions. Thank you for listening.